Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by George Flutus in Chicago, who is well known as a jazz drummer, but George is also a uh, really, really big fan and authority on John Bonham. George, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Bart. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, you, um, you've you come highly recommended from uh, our mutual friend Dan Garza, who people know from the uh, Peisty episode, which um, I think was just awesome. It was a two-parter, and uh, he, he has told me that, and I've found out on my own from doing a little research on you, you are definitely a... Uh, a big Bonham fan, but also a great jazz drummer. So I think you, uh, you're you the perfect guest for this episode. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dan, doing that. I, I really enjoyed I, I didn't get to listen to the entire two parts. Yeah. But um, everything that I heard was was really great, really interesting. Yeah, that was a that was a long episode. <laughs> it was, yeah, <laughs> that was an well, awesome one. But well, that's a long history, you know. Yeah, Pisces, It's there's a lot there. Yeah, which which Bonham um, is 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 right in there um as a part of that so i'm sure we'll talk about piety a little bit in this episode but um yeah so right off the bat i want to say um so this one obviously dan garza got us connected but i've gotten a lot of recommendations over the years for this um most recently the ones i could find because i'm working on my my as i mentioned in a, a pretty recent episode i'm working on my system of keeping track of all these suggestions but i believe rick Mackey uh suggested a bonham episode um, Terry Keating, I've talked to before, Bonzolium. He's going to be on the oh, show yeah. talking about something else. Uh, he's a my, huge my bu- good buddy. <laughs> yeah, everyone loves yeah. Terry. Um, oh, yeah. And then Adam Stachelek. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Adam. I think I've pronounced it wrong before. But um, he actually sent an Instagram comment, which that's where I'm kind of like, uh, that's where I'm trying to keep all this stuff together of, of YouTube comments and Instagram comments with suggestions. So thanks yeah. to all those folks and uh, anyone else who suggested this. But um, I want to learn more a little bit later about what got you so into Bonham, but I, I think people want to really just dive right into hearing about, uh, you know, many people's favorite drummer, John Henry Bonham, um, obviously of Led Zeppelin. So why mm-hmm. don't we go back to the beginning of his life um, and just talk about, you know, when he was born, his boyhood, all that stuff, and we'll just go uh, go from there. Yeah, so John was born in Redditch, Worcestershire, England, on May 31st, 1948. Uh, he was one of three children. He had a brother named uh, Mick and a sister, Debbie, who was also, um, she's, a, she's a musician, vocalist. Hmm. And his brother, Mick, became a photographer. He was a disc jockey. Um, the, the little that I know is, is about his childhood is basically from, you know, a couple um, – books that were written. There's a thunder of drums by Chris Welch. And then there's also a, a, an excellent book that his brother Mick wrote about his life. Mm-hmm. And that one I would really highly recommend if you're not familiar with it, because it's oh. more of an intimate family portrait of John. And there's a lot of really great stories, particularly about his childhood, actually, in that book. So, um, you know, he was, by all accounts, he was always into banging on things around the house from a very young age, from the time he was a toddler, basically. Mm. So he always had this kind of innate, you know, drive to make noise by hitting things. And uh, his brother says a a good amount of the time it was hitting him as well. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds about right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, I I think he was, he, he got a snare drum when he was about 10 years old. Uh, after you know setting up um coffee tins and sure. pots and pans and stuff like that his parents you know they finally realized like i don't think this is just a passing phase <laughs> you know maybe we should get him a proper drum yeah so he got a snare drum when he was about 10 and i think he got his first kit by the time he was like an early teen like 14 15 years old which you know i've 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 read that and heard that and and like um that's so interesting to have a snare. I guess I just didn't grow up with that. I had I kind of started with a little junky, you know, percussion plus drum set instead of a yeah. snare, just a snare. It's like that's a lot. That's a long time to be playing the snare drum. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't really know exactly, you know, what that timeline was. I I know that that his father got him a used kit and uh, Bonzo. Sure. Bonzo referred to it as mostly rust. (laughs) So it was like a beat up. I think it was a premier kit. 
And and I I think that that according to Mick Bonham's book, I think it was a little earlier than fifteen because he was already starting to play like little socials and yeah and um, you know parties at the local dance hall or whatever with with some other teenage uh, kids. But once he started playing with you know a couple bands more regularly, he ended up getting a tricks on kit oh wow that's cool and there are a couple pictures of him playing i believe it's that kit although in the in the book i i i recall mick bonham saying that it's a sparkle kit of some kind either mm. red or blue sparkle and in the photos it doesn't look like it it looks more like a pearl finish but he's so young looking in the photograph he's there, there's two pictures and one of the pictures is like a posed shot with the other guys in the band i think it was terry webb and the spiders which was um, one of like the local Brum bands, as they call them, you know, the Birmingham area music scene of that time. Brum beat is what interesting. They, I've never heard of they, that. They, yeah, Brum beat was a, a, you know, it's like saying the Mercy Sound or something. It was just like a distinctive style of rock and roll that was being played in the Birmingham area. Yeah. So Bonzo was was in that environment. And he was hearing that kind of music going on as a teenager, and they were trying to emulate. Um, you know, those sounds and also the look, you know, with the hairdos. And sure. So, so in the photographs, you know, you see this really young Bonzo, uh, no facial hair, you know, of course. He's a kid. And, <laughs> and, and one of the photos he's actually playing, you know, he's, he's like in the, in the midst of playing. And it's the only photo that I know of, of him playing, actually playing the drums before you see a photo of him with Zeppelin. Wow. There are, there are many photos of him with other bands. Like he played with a band called the crawling King snakes, which Robert plant was, was a, a member of. And that's when they were getting to know each other as teenagers. Um, let's see who else did he play with? He played well early on. He played with this trio, the blue star trio. And they, they were the ones who just like, you know, played like these little, social kind of gigs and stuff but you know he was playing with all these different bands there was a band called the senators they recorded a a song for an album of, it was like a compilation of brum brum beat music hmm. and it's uh i think the tune is called she's a mod it's like she's a mod she's a mod da, 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 da. you know it's like yeah. so 60s exactly. mod sound you know <laughs> and and uh i can't say you can tell it's bonzo you yeah. know because the beat is so pretty typical and and it's the fidelity isn't that great sure. but you know he was probably 15 or 16 when that was made wow so i always think about him as a young person going from banging on coffee tins and all of that stuff and then getting a snare drum getting some basics you know maybe some basic rudiments together and then finally getting a drum set and by the time he gets a drum set if he's playing in bands like just little high school bands it's amazing to me that he pulled so much together and especially in terms of not just technique, but having a defined style and yeah. sound by the time he was 19. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I think we all, we feel this way as Bonham fans. It's meant to be like, truly it's like, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's just, it's, it's like it's some sort of providence. that yes, was work. <laughs> Like it's in him. I mean, to, to be yeah. like getting your drum set and then working and, and, you know, I, I felt, I mean, as, as a kid, I would play with bands with friends, but it would be like, you know, you'd be playing for me locally around like Cincinnati and different, you know, the region. But like, I mean, it just sounded like he was a working drummer very early on. And this is what he wanted to do. Well, that's the impression I get from from his brother's account, you know, that that he was so determined. He was obviously very driven and passionate about it. And he also believed, I think he must have believed in himself and his ability because he seems to have had somewhat of a very confident personality. You know, like you hear stories about him saying, coming into a club or into a, a show and listening a little bit and, and on the intermission telling the band leader, your drummer is not very good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I should sit in and wow. I think I think you'll like me better. And and he and he would do that. And yeah. and it worked, at least, you know, on one or two occasions. Um, one of the problems was because he played with so much authority and power, <laughs> I guess he was, you know, pretty loud even back then. Yeah. On those smaller kits and stuff, uh, they were losing gigs. You know, so either he would get fired from a band or 
the, you know, the band would get fired and they're like, uh, they're getting frustrated because, you know, they want this gig, but, but the club owner told them they were too loud. Huh. I mean, there's stories about that from people like Dave Pegg, a bass player who was in a band with Bonham early on. He's a, he went on to be the bass player in Fairport convention. He recollects, um, that, you know, Bonham would kick his bass drum so hard. It would, you know, shake everybody in the band and in the club up, you know, just yeah. he had the right foot already. He had that power. Jeez. And, um, <laughs> yeah. so, and well, there weren't even, you know, they weren't even miking the drums back then. No, which is incredible. You know, he kind of developed this bit of a reputation, but he was confident in his ability. So like you said, if it was, it's almost as though he was following this course that had been sort of, you know, um, preordained sure. cosmically or something. <laughs> I would agree. You know? Now I want to ask you though. So maybe that's a little dramatic, but you know. <laughs> no. But I like it. If you're if you're listening to this, then you're probably a, a Bonzo fan, and you agree with Most that. Most likely, yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. But if we think about you know drummers like your favorite drummers and my favorite drummers of rock drummers, you, I mean. Bonham is always in the list of the most influential people. And I hope that's still true today for young, you know, 12, 13 year old drummer who's listening to Bonham and getting his mind blown. And he's one of his favorites. But yeah, hopefully this makes sense. John Bonham didn't have that luxury to be influenced by John Bonham. So the question is, who were his favorite drummers that made him into the drummer he was? Well, his his influences, I think, are pretty manifold. I I, I think that. You know, when Bonzo was coming up, when he was very young, probably around the time he got that snare drum, I'm sure he was aware of the music that his parents listened to at home, for example, which by his brother's accounts, um, you know, they loved big band dance, swing music, yeah. like Glenn Miller, uh, Benny Goodman. Um, you know, I don't know if Count Basie was in that list, but I recall reading that... Uh, his dad took them to see Harry James orchestra. And that would have been early on, maybe even in the late fifties, you know, or when Bonzo was like 10, 12 years sure, old. Yeah. And he was floored by the drummer who was the great Sonny Payne and Sonny Payne, of course, you know, is most famously associated with Basie's band. And I've always heard, and this is before I ever knew that, that Bonzo had an affinity for him. I heard a, a, a relationship between them just on my own. You know how it is like sometimes you listen to a drummer and you hear another drummer and you may not know through an interview or anything they said that they were influenced. You just hear it. You know, you sense like, oh, that that reminds me of so-and-so. Yep. And with Bonzo, I've always felt, when I hear Sonny Payne, the way his bass drum is tuned, the sound of his drums, um, the way he phrases, especially the way he sets up fills, the way he pulls back, the way he leaves space. These are all things that are really def definitive or characteristic of Bonzo's style. The big bass drum sound, that yep. kind of sense of timing. Um, so to me, when I, when I finally heard that, and I also read in an interview with Jimmy Page where he mentioned Sonny Payne, um, that, that John Bonham loved the Count Basie band and loved Sonny Payne. Well, then it made sense. You know, because yeah, for sure. uh, prob that probably stuck with him when you're that age and you're into the instrument, you know, getting into the instrument, your love of playing drums. If you're if you're starting out as a drummer, and I think especially at that time, the prominent drummers were Krupa, Buddy Rich, um, you know, uh, drummers. Th those were the celebrity drummers of the day. Yeah. So for sure, Bonzo was influenced by by them. I'm sure he heard Gene Krupa playing on Sing, 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 yep. you know, and heard that floor tom beat and and that attracted him. As a matter of fact, I know like one of his parents was a big Benny Goodman uh, fan. There you so go. his brother Mick said that he loved Gene Krupa. So if you're getting, you know, uh, there's a lot of speculation about Bonham. You know, he's such a mythological figure that I totally. think there's so many books that are written Um that have a lot of really great information in them. But sometimes I feel like claims are made also in articles that I've read over the years, you know, that um, he was influenced by this person or that person or whatever. And it's all very likely, but without actually getting it from the horse's mouth, like, i.e. an interview with Bonzo, yeah. of which there aren't that many, 
And there really aren't many interviews with him where he talks about his influences. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, there's almost none. And yeah. I always felt like that was such a shame that modern drummer didn't get to do an interview with him before he passed in 1980. Yeah. Because the magazine was still fairly young at that point. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, sure. it would have been such a treasure to have an interview of that nature. You know, it seems like a lot of times when people interview a great drummer, I think now it's better than it used to be, but it seems like yeah. often they're interested in asking all kinds of other questions, you know, and a lot of people focus on other aspects of Bonzo in relation to his life touring with Zeppelin and so forth. Yeah. Less about him as a person and his influences. Right. And, yeah. Right. So I will say this in, in the amount of time I've spent studying and listening and, you know, sort of like immersed in Bonham's drumming, for sure, he was influenced by people like Earl Palmer, Charles Connor, who played with Little Richard, you know, the famous intro, sure. Knockin', which everyone uh, always sort of holds up as, as like, that's that's where rock and roll exactly. came. Exactly, yeah. Song rock and roll. Yep. And, and yes, I believe that it did, and they may have been jamming on it in the studio that day, you know, just to blow off a little steam, because um, that's what the story is. But... Uh, you know, he doesn't play that intro note for note. And that's one of those things that I've read often is what people say, you know, he copied the intro to keep a knock and note for note, or he lifted it, something like that, you know, yeah. which is even more pejorative when you say lifted. He didn't lift it. He took, he took something that he loved and he adapted it and played it his own way. Which happens and all the time. There are differences, but there are differences. Yeah. So you know, to, that's why I consider Charles Connor an influence, even though Bonzo never said Charles Connor was one of my favorites. Yeah. I mean, he had to be aware of him. If you listen to "Keep a Knocking But You Can't Come In," or if you listen to "Tutti Fruity," or if you listen to any of Little Richard's albums, or you listen to any of those, you know, um, albums like Eddie Cochran, you know, like "Come On Everybody," you see Bonzo playing some of these songs like on the Royal Albert Hall footage and playing Come On Everybody and sure. something else. And he's playing the double-handed shuffle, you know, the kind of open shuffle, the train beat. Yeah. You know, some people call it a train beat. You know, that's coming directly from black rhythm and blues drummers, Earl totally. Palmer, Charles, Car Charles Connor. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like he has a a ton of influences, and and he's he's coming from that generation of 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 jazz, and he's really at an interesting time when music was completely changing. And I'm sure the bands that he was playing with, uh, you know, as a young guy, were really reflective of that kind of music. But yeah, that's a very good point. And it was changing because I feel like everything was where, like, you know, although you may listen to Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and all these guys playing with big bands. I think, you know, in the <laughs> he world, he wasn't playing big band gigs. No, it was going, it was sort of, right. I don't say it was going away, but it was not the like, I don't know. It was not the, like the music of the time exactly. So that kind of leads into, um, how things, so, so getting back on his timeline a little bit about how things, yeah. how he yeah. grew more. Let's yeah. I would, I would say, you know, clearly those celebrity drummers, like I was uh, referring to them, Buddy Rich and Krupa in particular, had an influence. Certainly, I think Max Roach had an influence because you could hear the references to certain things that he would do that are pretty much directly Max Roach influenced. Sure. Like how he would use, you know, and, and now amongst Bonham maniacs, this stuff has become more commonly known. Um, <laughs> so, like, for example... He would start off his Moby Dick drum solo live often by playing, quoting, I call it quoting, sure. um, quoting Max Roach's Drum Also Waltzes huh. from his Drums Unlimited record. So the Drum Also Waltzes is simply the bass drum on beat one, the hi-hat on two and three, and then you play this figure while that keeps going as an ostinato. So you've got boom, chip, chip, boom, chip, chip, boom, chip, chip, right? Yeah. And on top of that, the hands are doing this boom da 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 boom ch yeah. ch boom da 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 boom ch that's max's solo that's a thematic idea that he works up into this beautiful arrangement and then he he 
gets real busy with it and then he kind of gets simpler with it and then the song ends. So Bonham had to have heard that recording because he didn't just pull that out of the air to play that when he would do that on his solo starting in about 1969 yeah. or 70. Sure. And Drum Also Waltzes was recorded a few years before that. So that would have been a contemporary recording. And this is what I mean about like, yeah. I, this is what I find fascinating and I wish I could kind of know more, but part of it is the excitement through the mystery of of when you think about a, a figure like so iconic like bonzo it's like yeah. what was he doing did he go to a record store did he buy these records himself was he hanging out with someone who turned him on to these records you know like yeah. did he hear drum also waltz waltzes and go oh you know i want to cop that yeah. you know i'm gonna remember that <laughs> of course yeah. he did because he did it and he used it it's yeah. just like it's a nod. all of us it's, it's what we do you hear somebody play a cool lick and then you take it, you appropriate it for yourself, and then put it through the funnel of your experience. Totally. There's and nothing wrong with that. And that's what's so fantastic about him to me was he did all that at such a young age, but he sounded so much like himself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. By the time Zeppelin was one year old, his drumming style was so distinctive. I mean, even from the first album, the very first notes of the first album you know, the, the good times, bad times beat. Totally. Yes. I mean, that's, that's incredible. No one played a beat like that to my, to my knowledge. So as far as his influences go, you know, like I said, I think that, that Max was definitely in there. I think Elvin Jones must've been cause Elvin was another drummer who was also around England. Often Philly Joe Jones was living in England. And there are things that, that Bonzo does that are very Philly Joe like in terms of the rudimental soloing stuff. And a lot of people don't make this connection. Another thing is Philly Joe often did that triplet bass drum thing. He just did it generally in the course of soloing, not so much in a groove. Yeah. You know, but it's 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 simply the second and third triplet of a triplet figure played with the bass drum. Which is very bottom. I mean, that is like. Which is, that's like the signature, <laughs> yes. right? And then everyone says, well, you know, Carmine Apiece is sure. the one who, that's where Bonzo got it. And Bonzo said to Carmine, he said, I got it from you on whatever song it was. And, and Carmine said, I did that. And he goes, yeah, you did that. <laughs> you know, so I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of the story because Zeppelin were touring with Vanilla Fudge. Yeah. They were hanging out and Bonzo told him, I cop that, I nicked that from you. But, you know, he may have nicked it. He may have first heard it from Carmine, or maybe he heard a Philly Joe Jones solo. And Philly Joe went da -da 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 with his foot, yeah, you know? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I like that. It's just all about, like, that was the, the, those, those development years. Yeah. You know, when he's all ears, he's a sponge and he's, he was obviously very naturally gifted. He didn't have, so speaking about, you know, his early days, he really didn't have any formal private instruction. Um, Which is interesting. And maybe that's a good thing because it made him the drummer, his own, yeah. he just created his own uh, style and technique that we're all, you know, pretty thankful for today because we can all, everyone has learned from his playing. That's right. And, and, and I think a lot of people have learned from his playing the same way. They heard it and then they tried to emulate it. Oh yeah. And then they come up with their own thing. That triplet thing. So, every kid, when you first learn that, it's just <laughs> it's like you can't stop playing it. <laughs> right. Know? Right. It, there's it is there's something so satisfying yes. about it. Yeah. It's one of those satisfying beats. You know, like yeah. there are stories about Bonzo getting together. As a matter of fact, one time I was in a drum shop here in Chicago, the drum pad. It's an old shop that no longer exists. And I was, I went in the store and a, a, a guy that I knew, another local drummer, uh, was in the shop with a couple guys from England who were in town. And they were, I think it was during the drum show time, you know, the big sure. Chicago drum yeah, show. May. Yes. And, uh, and I think these guys were in town for the show, but they made a stop at the drum pad and they were just, you know, hanging out, uh, checking out the drum pad with, with, my friend rusty jones who was a great chicago jazz drummer and rusty introduced us and one of the guy's names was gary alcock is his name huh. and he's from the birmingham area so he was one of these you know midlands dance band uh big band players uh jazz musician and we got to talking you know, he seemed like a very nice guy. And he said, oh, I'd love to hear you play, mate, and all of this. And, sure, yeah. you know, maybe we could come out to your gig. I think I had a gig that weekend in town. 
and uh and then and they did actually eventually they came out to a gig i was doing but through the course of things when i found out he was from that area i said did you know john bonham when he was young and he goes oh i knew john he said i knew john when he was a boy huh. and he said you know john came over and i gave him a couple he said i didn't really want to call them lessons and you know he's like we just hung out and we played through some things i showed him you know some rudiments and and uh, he said we talked more than anything. And he said the thing about Bonzo was he was, he said he was really eager to, to to learn, like you know he real passionate, but he was already he could sense that he was restless. Huh, that's he wasn't interesting. you know. So he said he ended up not really being his teacher because of that because he he said he liked to hit the drum hard. <laughs> yeah, th the thunder. <laughs> so you don't have to lay into it with all you got every time, and. Um, but he said they actually would set up a, the, the couple times they got together. He said they set up drums. And I remember him saying something about he had a small flat. So there was a drum set in the kitchen. And he said they set up two two kits and they played, mm. you know. Yeah. And Bonzo would have been like maybe 15 or so at that point, 15 or 16. Wow. And he said he got the feeling that he really wasn't all that interested you know, and going further with it. Like he got what he needed out of their meetings. Hmm. And, you know, he didn't want to be a jazz drummer. He wasn't going to be a jazz musician per se. Yeah. I think he already had it in his head that he wanted to be a rock and roll player, but he loved drums so much that how could you not be attracted to swing drumming? Totally. And, and those and, drummers. And, you know, yeah. And those drummers. Right. Yeah. Right. So oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and that's what I mean is like, I think his development was fairly rapid from the age of about 16 to 20. Yeah. yeah. You know, he, he, he must have put in some serious woodshed time because Bonzo had very good hands. There's a lot of people, I think they think of him as just like a heavy hitter, you know, yeah. and he played big triplets for sure. You know, and that's about it. No way. Oh, no. You and, know, and his Bonzo foot. had great technique yeah. and it refined as the years went by very quickly. Yeah, for so sure. So we can talk about that a little more, you know, in terms of the timeline. This episode is brought to you by Burn Cymbals. Burn Cymbals are custom made instruments handcrafted one at a time by cymbalsmith Ray Byrne. Each cymbal has its own unique voice with a rich and complex spread that can help you stand out by creating your own distinctive sound. Burn cymbals are available at some of the best drum shops in the U.S. and around the world, as well as a select offering of pieces ready to ship on the Burn Cymbals website. For a limited time on BurnCymbals.com, use code DRUMHISTORY for free shipping. That's B-Y-R-N-E Cymbals.com and code DRUMHISTORY for free shipping. And as you probably guessed, you've been hearing Burn Cymbals on this ad played by Anthony Tadeo. I think we're we're getting close to the point. Obviously, that's a great. I mean, look at his his you know start and when he grew. You know, his his development. But we're obviously getting closer to his his joining of one of the most famous bands in history. Which, um, right? How old was he when he when Zeppelin actually joined up? Uh, I read a Robert Plant book about uh, you know. The, his and it was it was so long ago. I can't really remember much of the details. But what what was that early? you know, joining up with those guys like? Well, you know, he was associated with Plant. They became friends and colleagues playing with a couple different bands, uh, most notably uh, Band of Joy. But um, there was also a band called the Crawling King Snakes. Yeah, I don't yeah. know a lot about those bands. Sure. You know, they were sort of like incidental. Uh, they were sort of stepping stones, you know, they were groups where they had fun playing mostly like blues or rhythm and blues kind of covers. But they knew, as you said earlier, they knew each other. They knew each other and they're both the same age. Bonzo's a little older than Plant. Bonzo's, so Bonzo would have been, at the time Zeppelin was formed, he was 20. Because Zeppelin was formed in, in August, basically, of 68. And Earlier that year, Bonzo started working with Tim Rose, who's a vocalist you may be familiar with. And Tim Rose was somewhat of a, that was somewhat of a sweet gig for him because he was making something like 40 pounds a week, which at that time was good money. Bonzo had met, you know, his wife in, who was from the area, um, Pat, and they, 
had had a son shortly, you know, after. I think Jason's born in 1966, so he's my age. Mm. We're, I'm born in October of 66. So, you know, he he had he had a, a mouth, a little mouth to feed. Yeah, at a young age. And, and, wow. And he, yeah, and he worked he worked off and on. Like I said, his father had a construction business. I believe it was the grandfather's business. So it was like the John Henry Bonham construction company or <laughs> which something, is the coolest you know? name of like, any company yeah you know and and in and uh i think bonzo thought you know well i gotta work so he did work for the family's construction business off and on um apparently the the, the job foreman was a taskmaster and and he was this big guy you know and mick bonham said you know he he didn't take shit off of anyone and bonzo bonzo's heart wasn't in the construction business like it was in drumming. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he was somewhat, yeah, he was somewhat distracted. <laughs> yeah. You know, he did that a little bit, but he was also trying to gig and his dad had a van uh, or a truck of some kind and he was able to have wheels, you know, which was important in those days to get, get your drums around. Yeah. Um, so the bands, the bands that he was knocking around with at that time, they weren't really making a whole lot of money, but it was good experience and I'm sure it was good fun. Uh, but what he got with Tim Rose, so so the Band of Joy actually was a professional band as well. Like he was in this band called The Way of Life, and they did, I think, a, a couple little recordings. And then the Band of Joy got some studio time, and they ended up recording several tunes, which you can you know hear on YouTube. You can find these these songs. They recorded a couple blues covers, and they did a version of Hey Joe, which is actually pretty cool. Oh yeah. They did a cover of they did a cover of Hey Joe. They did a cover of For What It's Worth. And, you know, things were looking a little optimistic, more optimistic for that band. But when he got this offer to play with Tim Rose, that was more of like a professional regular gig. He was making good money. So when Jimmy Page needed to regroup, basically, because the, the Yardbirds ended, um he he found John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones saw, I think, saw that Jimmy was looking f to put a band together to yeah. kind of reform the Yardbirds as the new Yardbirds. And so Jones contacted him, say, I'd love to be a part of your new project. And they knew each other from studio work in, in England, in London. So now the question was, we need a drummer and a vocalist. So they found yeah. out about, they found out about Plant and Plant told them about Bonzo. So when they went to go hear Bonzo playing with Tim Rose, it, I think it was obvious to Tim Rose that they were spending a lot more time talking and they knew each other, but they were spending a lot more time talking to Bonzo than they were to him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, Peter Grant, the manager, yeah. you know, and Jimmy were kind of like, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, work yeah. and kind of pull them away. And, uh, and Bonzo was reluctant at first. He was actually quite reluctant because there, the story is there were many, many messages to Bonzo coming from Peter Grant, coming from Robert Plant, you know, saying, hey, what's up? You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to decide on this? And and yeah, I think it was probably a tough decision given the fact that he had a wife and a, a, a new family, a young family, and uh, he was making decent money. But he yeah. and he also had an offer from Joe Cocker. Oh, wow. To play with Joe Cocker. Uh, but in the end, I think he realized that the music that Jimmy was going to play or was looking to play was of more interest, you know, in terms of just the taste, the aesthetic. Of sure. It. Sure. Man, hindsight is twenty twenty because now you look and you're like, it's Zeppelin. Oh, man. Come on. But but like, that's a, a tough decision. Can really? you He's imagine? Got, like you said, mouths to feed. And uh, I mean, you're working and you don't know what's going to happen with this new band, but Man, thank God for all of us that he he took that leap and um Yeah, it happened rather quickly because I think, you know, he was on he was playing with Tim Rose in early mid sixty eight. Um he turned twenty in in May, you know, May thirty first is his birthday. So he turns twenty years old, sometime in July, Jimmy Page comes to him, says, Hey, you know, we'd like to bring you into our thing. And by August, they had their first rehearsal, which was at, uh, it was below Ronnie Scott's jazz club, below or above. I can't remember wow. now, but it was a so much history room. There were, yeah, I mean, there was like, um, you know, Ronnie Scott's is in a different location now. And I played at Ronnie Scott's, you know, many times over the years. 
Um, but back then, Ronnie's was in a different location. It was like in Chinatown in, in London. Mm. And uh, Gerard Street, I think it was. And this rehearsal space, they would rent out rehearsal spaces above the club. I think it was above the club. And the band got together there. And you know, as Jones put it, you know, from the very first opening notes of Train Kept a Rolling, which was the first song they jammed on because they really didn't know what else to play. Yeah, really. It's kind of like, what do you know? You know, it's one of those moments. <laughs> yeah, totally like, I don't know, what there. do you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and Jones said he knew immediately that it was a match made in heaven. You know, they mm. just locked right in and the rest is history. So that was when they, you know, really the spark ignited. Absolutely. And it burned pretty bright for 11 years. You know? Yeah, which, I mean, my God, he's 20 years old. That's just unbelievable. So yeah, him and him and plant. Oh I mean, God. the so, seniors in the band, you know, Jimmy was the senior. And how he was, was born he? in 44. Okay, so he's four so years Jimmy older. Page was 24 years old. <laughs> Which, I mean, you <laughs> and are he was kid. the experienced senior. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, so he he then he's basically he's in Zeppelin um and and it it's a then it's just a rocket ship obviously. I mean, Zeppelin is is as we know huge, but how did he do personally then? I mean, like he's got, he's married, he's got a kid. Everything was, I'm sure money was coming in then. Um, uh, just yeah. What's, I mean, what's I, you know, personally? I can't, I can't speak with a lot of authority about the personal life. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of conjecture about it. There's been so many books. There was a, a book that just came out recently called Beast, which, eh, you know, I don't really appreciate the title of that. Yeah. Because to me, that seems to like right from the outset focus on this, you know, other aspect, which often gets focused on, you know, rather yeah. than really, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, sure. Uh, I would say, you know, say as far as like learning about the his, you know, like some of his, his, his life history, um, you know, concurrent with being in Zeppelin. Uh, his the book written by his brother Mick Bonham is a really good resource for that. Um, Thunder of Drums is an excellent book written by Chris Welch, but you know there there really isn't a whole lot of. Um, I guess yeah. I just don't feel that that comfortable talking no, sure. or speculating, you know, about like like what he was going through personally. I know that. He really, and, and I think this is common knowledge, he really didn't like being on the road that much. Okay. That's you know, good I mean, know. I think he loved, I think he loved being in the band and playing music night after night. I think yeah. that that was for him, you know, those were the golden moments being on stage and improvising because Zeppelin were a very improvisatory rock band. Yeah. They weren't the kind of rock band that plays the tunes the way they were recorded on the album. And Every gives night. people the show that they kind of expect from hearing on the radio at the time, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. playing all the hits, you know. And that's not to take away from any bands that did that, but, you know, bands like, I don't know, the Eagles or something, you know, where like you go to the concert, you're going to hear the song played with maybe the same solos even or very similar. With Zeppelin, it was very extemporaneous right from the beginning all the way pretty much to the end. But yeah. especially those formative years when they were – playing you know they were hungry and they were hell-bent on taking over you know the world yeah <laughs> when they yeah. came to the united states i mean they blew people away you know um people were just they they caused such a shock wave through the country yeah um, on that first on that first tour and especially i think you know the first tour was one thing i think where they really caused the shock wave was later in 69 because by then they shook off whatever you know maybe trepidation they had or insecurities you know obviously as a brand new band they recorded their first album in october of 68 they played some dates in the uk and in scandinavia well they played scandinavia before they even recorded the album so those were their first gigs and they were bound to a contract on uh as the Yardbirds, that Jimmy Page had a bunch of dates that, that were oh, arranged already. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so so to fulfill these Yardbirds dates, they they went billed as the new Yardbirds. But then when they got back from that short little tour of Scandinavia, they went into Olympic Studios to record with Glenn Johns, 
which is interesting to see. You know, I don't know if you've been watching the Let's the totally the get the get yes. back Beatles documentary. Yeah, yeah. So that's you know that's like right after Glenn Johns wow. recorded Zeppelin one. Jeez, that's like a- <laughs> December or January of of sixty nine. It's and just Glenn like John's, a magical it, it was time. just so amazing to think a magical time. And just to think like John's had just finished Zeppelin's first album and here he is recording, let it be. Wow. And just the whole vibe of that time, you know, and these drummers, like, you know, iconic drummers, you know, working <laughs> yeah. with one after the other. <laughs> so they so embarked cool. on this tour. They, their first tour started at the end of December of 68 and went through until almost uh, March. I think sometime in February of 69. So that first tour, they were an opening act basically for Vanilla Fudge. Which um, we have to talk about. Maybe this is a good time. Um, his relationship with Carmine Apiece, they were friends. And there's it's kind of famous that uh, Carmine got him into Ludwig drums. And uh, they had a they had a pretty strong relationship. Yes. Yeah. I think Carmine really admired him. He saw him as this young kid who's got a lot of fire and has a lot of talent and you know bonzo was playing a ludwig kit he was basically playing i don't know if it was a rental or if it was a kit that they bought for the tour but the kit was never seen before those american dates Mm. so you know it's it's very possible that it was something that they just acquired as a type of backline uh, or, or he bought it you know somebody bought it in new york or wherever just before the tour started so I, I, that's one thing, you know, that I get a little, I, I'm, I'm prone to go off on tangents about the minutia because sure. I find it fascinating, but a lot of people don't. But I think in general, a lot of drummers, it's like guitar players, you know, certain instrumentalists, they really fixate on things about equipment and yeah. gear. Yeah. You know, you yeah, know he, what I mean? Have you found that Bart? Uh, like- yeah. I mean, he, with Bonham especially, <laughs> and that's kind of leading into me thinking about his mic techniques and things like that in the studio where, yeah, Bonham yes. uh, in particular kind of has a, and there's also a lot of like, uh, that's not how we did it. He did it like this. Exactly. Oh, that's not right. And it's a lot of back and exactly. forth. And I love sometimes just folding my arms and watching people <laughs> just go at it because, yeah. you know. I don't like to say, you know, I'm not an expert on anything, but I, I have spent a lot of time with Bonham's music, you know, analyzing his, his gear, the, the history, you know, so it's somewhat of a, like a, a a historian's approach to it, you know, totally. Um, And there are so many instances where I'm just like, you know, we don't know that we don't know if he bought the drum set unless there's an invoice that shows that it was purchased by him. Yeah. We don't know if he bought that first kit. We know that it ended up with Robert Plant and Robert Plant ended up selling it recently at auction. Oh, boy. Wow. A few years ago. So that 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 kit that was on the first tour was Black Diamond Pearl Ludwig um, 20. I think it was a 22, 13, and two 16s. Yeah. Um, God, that had to sell for a pretty penny. And on the tour, he was playing it. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think the guy who bought it is the guy. What's the M-Pop? Is that what it's called? The Museum of Pop Culture. Paul Allen is is, uh, the Museum of Pop Culture. And that's where the drum kit ended up. And I believe it's there right now. Wow. Like on display. But yeah. So, you know, a few weeks into their tour, Carmine was like, man, you need to get a bigger kit. I'll hook you up with a bigger kit. (laughs) So that's what he did. He contacted (laughs) Ludwig. He had him order up a a kit, maple thermal gloss, just like what Carmine had. And um, the kit, interestingly, I don't know if you know this, but recently a, a, a discovery was made about the bass drum. And Terry and I have always suspected that the bass drum was not 14 deep, that it was deeper. Because in, in, in most of the photos, it looks like it just looks deeper than a 14. Yeah. So, you know, my friend Terry, who has his YouTube channel, Bonzolium, um, he's always been very passionate about his opinion on that. You know, yeah. like, there's no way that was a 14. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was great to get validation from a, a, a mutual friend of ours, a guy named Bill Harrington, who did a, a a great article on the thermal gloss kit. He actually traveled to England and the kit is in the possession of Paul Thompson, the drummer from Roxy music, which, so, you know, it's, it's interesting to me too, that like we, it's such a different uh, era where it's before, 
so much documentation that it can be so elusive and up in the air that things aren't documented like they are today, where you look at a picture that's like an ultra high right. def picture that someone shot on their phone. Um, right. So there can be this this sort of like, oh, no, it was this. I totally think that that adds to a little bit of the allure of like uh, the mystique, as we've said before, like just this this sort of like quest for knowledge and things are coming out uh always well and then people i've i've seen stories of people you know i've heard people say i saw him playing with two bass drums um and it wasn't at a time where he would have had two bass drums you know so there's a there's like that sort of mythologizing he (laughs) definitely played two bass drums later in 69 but on the first tour there's no proof that he had two bass drums there's no photographs there's, you know, if, if Carmine got him a set with two bass drums, just like his, because Carmine had two, yep. they also are 15 inch depth, which was confirmed when Bill Harrington went to Paul Thompson's house and actually took pictures and measured everything. Yeah. And that's in a modern drummer article from a couple of years ago. You can, you can see that article and it's pretty cool. Um, Paul Thompson had cut down the, the, the 14 by 12 Tom to a 14 by 10. And it was professionally done, you know, by some drum maker or drum tech in England. Mm. And and it, it's almost like you can't tell it was cut down. But that famous, you know, big mounted tom that he had. Yeah. Uh, the maple thermogloss tom, it was cut down, unfortunately. God. Um, but, you know, like the, the double bass drum thing, you know, the stories are that he was playing the double bass drums for a while. And Jimmy and Peter Grant, no one could stand it. And Robert Plant even said, there's a a point at which Robert said, we used to hide his second bass drum. <laughs> it would piss him off. You know, but he only played the so he only played the double bass drums um as far as we know through photo, you know, evidence a, a handful of times in July and August of sixty nine. So they were in their midsummer tour, and that's when I really think they were taking the country by storm. Hmm. I think that, you know, when they went out and they were doing more headline type gigs not just opening for the fudge you know like they did in the early the first tour i think they turned a lot of heads i know that when they played in new york at the fillmore they were supposed to be opening uh part of the bill was iron butterfly and of course iron butterfly had their big hit within agata de vida and and you know they're popular band and zeppelin were not known the first album had just come out a month before yeah so you know, only hardcore rock and roll fans who are on the cutting edge would have known about Zeppelin and been enthusiastic. Most people were probably going like, hey, we're here to see the fudge or we're here to see, you know, the who or yeah, Iron totally. Butt. Like, who are these guys? <laughs> yeah. You know, and then bam, they hit him in the face with this is who we are. <laughs> got, got their mind blown. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And they got their mind blown. And that's what happened at the Fillmore that uh, Iron Butterfly were like almost booed off. <laughs> Like they wanted, there was like more Zeppelin, more yeah, Zeppelin. That's a tough act you know? to follow. Yeah, but can you imagine that's that's a rare thing, you know? Yeah. So when they came back around, the word spread like wildfire, and they came back again. Um, and then when they, by the time they did that tour in the summer of '69, maybe Bonzo felt a little more bold. I don't know, and he decided to set up two bass drums. But there's no bootleg recording. At least that's clear. There, there's one that I know of, but it's really poor quality, and you can't really tell he's playing two bass drums. You know. Yeah, and the um, one thing I've seen online is it said that he did use it uh, a lot. I think on even on the Wikipedia, it talks about how it, it was. You know, the other members would call. You know, they'd say that it was being overused. Uh, <laughs> it's overkill. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, so all right with, with with the timeline here of Bonham, you know, in particular. Do you want to maybe talk about his his drums that he used, you know, further going moving forward? Because uh, gear wise, I mean, I think typically he's he's almost with Ludwig like like uh, I mean, he is Ringo <laughs> level of like famous, he is, yeah. you know, especially I mean, as time went on. I think especially as time went on, like early on, Ringo had such a major influence, like as soon as yeah. the Beatles hit the States, it was like they couldn't produce enough black diamond pearl drum kits yeah. or black oyster you know i mean uh, th- they just couldn't produce enough to satisfy the demand yeah. whereas with bonham i think it kind of like evolved over the years and really grew especially after he passed 
You know? Totally. Even today, it's like um, you today. Know, this I mean, delights. today you could you could almost argue that it's more influential now than ever. Yeah. The the amber vista lights, you know, um, the green sparkle kit. So, okay. So as far as the drum kits go, one thing I wanted to kind of bring up in tandem with that is the way his playing developed, because you know on those early tours, he he was playing you could hear so much like vitality and like like a it's like a like the 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 birth of a volcano yeah. you know there's just this explosive level of creativity that's going on but it's a bit raw sure you know like times where you hear him go for things and you know maybe it's a, it's a little on the on the edge or on yeah. the verge of you know coming apart and even jones sure. said that sometimes he would try things but the thing is, is that the creative fire is burning so bright and he's got this innate sense of sound, you know, not just bashing, hitting hard. Of course, you know, he could hit hard and he could kick the hell out of the bass drum, um, maybe harder than anybody at the time, yeah. you know. But that in itself is not an attribute that's like, you know, that's not a musical attribute. That's just like fun for some people you know to say you know no one hit as hard as bonham well i'm sure there were people who hit very hard but yeah. they may not have been musical yeah the thing about the distinguishes bonham is that he could hit hard but it was always musical it was always musically satisfying the greatest drummers that play loud are the the reason they're great and they're still you know um recognized and and are iconic now is because they did that in a musical way. Yeah. Not just bash the hell out of the drums, not just bash it. Right. Art Blakey could play very loud. You know, buddy rich could play very loud. Um, Elvin Jones could play very loud. These guys could hit hard. Philly, Joe Jones, Tony Williams, like all of my favorite drummers had a huge dynamic range. They could play as soft as a whisper, or they could just come up to thunder, you know, thunderstorm levels. And and Bonham is the same to me. Bonham had a very wide range of dynamics. He had an extremely finesse touch when he played soft, softly. Totally. Yeah. And when he played loudly, it was always full of groove. And I, I, I don't know how else to put this, but I like no, to call yeah. it, uh, it's like a fat warmth. <laughs> that's a good you know, way it's to, not an, to yeah it, it's not an abrasive hard hurts your ears loud it might hurt your rib cage but it doesn't hurt your ears yeah <laughs> at least no. mine nice it's like and, it's, a, yeah. it's almost like i can never i can never get enough of that feeling because it surrounds you it's a, it's a concept of sound i think that bonham really was borderline genius in this respect in terms of sound like he knew how to play to get the sound out of his drums that perfectly suited the musical situation. Yeah, and things were very rounded and they would ring out and they would be very right. tonal maybe as opposed to, let's say, Ringo, which was very tea towel and dampened and, you know, duh, 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 that and was the done. antithesis. Yeah, Bonzo was the antithesis to that. Yeah. He hardly used any muffling other than his bass drum and, you know, a bit on the snare. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, so, uh, so getting to this like developmental thing, like from, from the time he joined Zeppelin to about 1970, let's say his playing has, has a certain sound, you know, a certain sound and a certain feel. And by 70, it's, it's, it's evolving, it's changing. And it seems rapid to me. Like I think about like, you know, in terms of, my own development, let's say, you know, I'm, I don't consider myself anywhere, anywhere near any kind of innovative, you know, level like these great drummers that we're talking about. But I know that over time, my playing has changed and, and I'm sure, you know, your playing has changed and all oh, yeah. drummers this process of evolution with bottom. I look at it like, man, did he change quickly? It was like his progression and his his level, you know, he was a great drummer in, in 1968 when he recorded Good Times, Bad Times. No question. The way he plays the blues numbers on there shows this level of finesse and dynamics, you know, like on Days and Confused or on You Shook Me. Um, the way he plays a fast rock and roll number like Communication Breakdown is perfect. 
you know, like yeah. the intensity, the groove, everything's there. Then the way he plays the opening song, and I was talking about this before, like who comes up with that beat for the debut, the first song on your debut album? That's phenomenal to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That bass drum work, the integration of the toms and the snare, the riding on the cowbell. The oh. whole thing is just like, man, this is a really cool, unique beat. It's to this day. I mean, that is the most iconic. Uh, I just remember playing that I had, as a kid. Like, a, I think it was like a, you know, one of the best of uh, CDs or something. I would play over and over again of that beat. I mean, and that cowbell sound, you don't hear that very often. Anything like that. No, ever. No, and if you hear a cowbell, it's generally going to be like tink, 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 yeah. tink. It's not going to be ding, 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 yep. ding, 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 ding. It's almost like he's playing a Latin type groove on the cowbell. Then the bass drum's going do 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 gaga go 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 gaga do 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 da da do 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 do. You know the triplets and the eighth notes that are quick, and it's just like, where did he come up with this? I did an analysis video for my YouTube channel of the first album. And so starting with that very first song, I talk quite a bit more about Good Times, Bad Times than any other song on the album, just because it's it's the song on the album that really is the most substantive in some ways, you know, drumming wise. Sure, yeah. Um, and in breaking that down, you know, I was, it, it, I, I just found that um, the rhythm that he played, it follows the lick, follows the riff, I should say so closely that that that's one of the distinguishing factors of Bonham's drumming is that more than many other drummers, especially of that era, he would come up with beats that shadowed or complemented in tandem with the melody or with the melodic riff. So, you know, that, that, that riff of course is, um, do 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 go 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 go. Now what he plays is very much related to that rhythm of the melody. He's not just going doom doom tat, but doom doom tat, doom doom tat. He's he's following along with the do do dig a dig a do go dig go go do 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 go ga ga go do go go go. You know, so that that right there, it might seem like obvious to a lot of people who are really into bottom, but many people who either aren't aware of it or aren't into Bonham might miss that, that his drumming style is a very organic. um, It developed, I think very organically off of his musical ear. I think Bonzo had a really, really musical like instrumentalists kind of ear. Completely agree. And I I mean, like I think of black dog too, where it's like, he just kind of reversed the main beat that we all know and just did that. I mean, it's just those little things where it's like, it's almost, I don't right. want to say it's simple, but it's like no one else is thinking. He, he makes it sound, it's 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 where he comes up with it just off the top of his head, and it's just perfect and amazing. But uh, especially at that time, it's, he's, I mean, he's, he's a genius drummer. I think so. I think he's doing things that, uh, right. And they're not necessarily super complex, like a drummer. I don't know why this guy just popped into my head, but the drummer from Coliseum, John Heisman. He played in a way that was, they're, they're basically like a very jazz influenced rock band, uh, sort of an early English fusion band, you know, or you think about like Yes, for example, like yeah. Bill Bruford, you know, with Yes. Those are styles of drumming that are complex and in many ways more complex than what, of course, what Bonzo was doing. But there's a certain thing about Bonzo's way of playing songs, basically composing a drum part that is so distinctive to him and it lends so much personality to the song. And I think that's why Zeppelin sounded so compelling to people. It's one of the reasons that they were so compelling. And, you know, in addition, you have these Titans, you know, of like Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones. They're, yeah. they're, they're master musicians, producers, you know, but then you've got Bonzo who is not just the drummer. He's a quarter of Led Zeppelin. He is definitely a quarter of Led Zeppelin. You know, and you can't yeah. say that about every drummer of every band. No, that is such a good point. And I think you're you're absolutely right where you can't. I mean, he, Bonham would probably be, be Bonham would probably be great in any band he was in. But I mean, Zeppelin is just a perfect 
storm of these four guys. And you're right. He's a quarter it's, of it. It's alchemy. It's a perfect alchemy. Did he contribute to the writing process at all? Or was he just purely like, yeah, I mean, you know, I think of it this way. It's like, did he put a pen to paper yeah. and write notes? Probably not. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, but did, if you consider writing coming up with a part that is a distinctive, uh, yeah. you know, feature good, of the song, definitely good way to put it. Yeah, definitely. Right, I'm sure because arranging, I just, like, let's do this a couple more yeah, times. Like, yeah, like, maybe we should, exactly. And I think he did do that. I mean, there's some recordings of them in the studio um, running over things, like for physical graffiti and that. You can hear a little bit of that. For example, uh, I'm thinking now about In My Time of Dying. Yeah. You know, the drum beat that he plays once they kick off and they get into that next section of verses, you know, I never did no wrong, you know, there again, that's the riff. The riff is right. That figure. Yeah. And he plays a drum part that mimics that figure, but it's also grooving like, a like, like hell, you know? So it's not just this busy kind of um, drum oriented beat. It, it it has this it it, it go it, it's it's just like this the the most the most brilliant and organic way of combining playing the drums within a beat and also grooving yeah so the groove is never sacrificed but it's also a, an interesting groove it's not just grooving real hard but without a whole lot of interaction and and no question he com he contributed to the composition. Even just that drum part, it, to me, that's part of the, the that's writing. You're writing the song. It's I like Kashmir. He supposedly came up with Kashmir with the repetitive riff that goes over the course of the six beats. You know, da 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 da. Now I don't know if he went to Jimmy and said, "Jimmy, I have an idea for this song." It goes da 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 da. -da. You <laughs> yeah. go up, okay. you know, <laughs> like maybe he did. Sure, that we can't really know for sure unless Jimmy Page says it at some point in an interview. Yeah. Um, but he's credited with that, you know? So I think in that sense, yeah, he, he was a composer. He contributed to the compositions and contributed definitely to the arrangements. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So there's a couple things I want to just make sure we cover before we, uh, you know, I mean, again, we could talk for five hours. We could talk endlessly about bottom, but um, so I can, the, uh, yes. unfortunately <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> so the Amber Vista lights, which we touched on before, which are obviously he, he had other drums along the way, but those are like the, it's just what you think of like his signature where almost now, if you see a guy or a girl mm -hmm. playing Amber Vista lights, fortunately or unfortunately, that's Bonham. It's, There's no it, like, it, it, yeah, you know what I yeah, mean? It's they're forever. Signature. They're inextricably linked with Bonham. And if you own an Amber Vista light kit, Anyone who's a drummer is going to be like bottom, bottom, you know, <laughs> or, or who's not a drummer. Yeah. Actually, I think in some respects, it's more the uh, lay people, you sure. know, because it's such a, you know, it's, it's such an obvious, it's, it's a bright orange acrylic drums. Yeah. You know? It's definitely a, an attention getter, but you know, I, so what's the story? The, well, in between, in between the Vista lights and his maple thermal gloss kit, he had a series of um, kits that were green sparkle. And the green sparkle kits are just, you know, classic Ludwig uh, three ply maple poplar maple shell. Um, the bottom sizes as, as many people refer to them. So the bass drum was not a 2615, like the thermal gloss, the bass drum was the conventional 14 inch depth. And he likely had a couple of these kits. Uh, for sure, he had duplicates of the bass drum. Yeah, um, It's not really known how many kits he had exactly, but I do believe he had at least two, maybe three. Um, one of the kits got trashed pretty badly in Milan, Italy in 1971 at a concert where there was a, a riot. Police threw tear gas and all hell broke loose and the yeah. drums ended up getting thrown all over the place. Gear was all over the place. Jeez. But, you know, they may have been able to salvage them and repair any damage done. I don't think they were crushed or anything. But the common knowledge is that he preferred his green sparkle wood shell kits for studio use. Yeah. throughout his that he didn't really record with the uh, 
the Vistalites. I can see that. Um, it doesn't sound like he recorded any studio work with the Vistalites. I mean, they have a pretty they have a pretty distinctive sound, uh, that kind of rubbery, you know, sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't hear that on any of the albums. He did use the steel kit, however, for recording um, in through the outdoor. And in f some photos, there's a couple photos, and most Bonham fanatics know about these photos from Polar Studios when they were recording in through the outdoor. You can see the steel kit set up, but you can also see a green sparkle or what looks like a green sparkle kit set up in the corner. And that kit is not complete, like the snare drum is away from it, and yeah. but it's like a bass drum and the, the toms are there. And there's a couple mics by it, but not really all mic'd up. Yeah. And the bass drum head is a clear rezzo. The, the resonant head is clear, and there's a felt strip across the front. So that's very different than what most people think of for Bonham's, you know, setup technique. He almost always had a uh, smooth coated, I mean, a smooth white head on the front, you know, often with the three circle logo um, until he got the Vista lights. And then that was a clear head with the logo, but you never saw any muffling on the front of the bass drum head. It was always a mm. felt strip on the back. Um, so, you know, I, I really don't know for sure what he used in the studio, especially when it comes to symbols, because gotcha. that's a whole other topic for, for, you know, if you get deep into Bonzo, it's like the symbols. It's like, oh, what symbols was he using? Yeah, with the Pisces, um, which, again, talking back to going back to Dan Garza on the uh, Pisces right. history, because he, he was, I mean, um, he was a Pisces guy. I mean, really, but but I guess so what you're saying, though, yeah. is once you're actually in the studio, you probably use a, a all, bet, all of, bets are off unless yeah. there's photographs. Sure. That's my thing. It's like it's it's like we're in court now. You know, you have to show the evidence. <laughs> yeah. The Bonzo Court, <laughs> which we, you, you and Terry, there are, and that's why we. I I personally, I mean, I'm a lifelong Zeppelin fan, but I I think I it's I need to tread softly because there's uh, some very diehard bonzo fans and zeppelin fans yeah um, oh and it's okay you know it's okay to have uh, your opinions and it's, it makes it fun to throw sure. throw these things around but when whenever someone starts to get adamant like or say this is definitively or they try to make money off of it that's yeah. the other thing it's like you know sometimes you see people well uh, you know i can understand why jason is so protective yeah. of, of course his father's legacy totally and the family because there's a lot of assertions that are made, you know, by different people. I'm not going to start naming names, but, you know, yeah, there's some people out there who claim to have, you know, Bonham's kit or have this or have that or know how he did something or what he used in the studio. And, um, you know, we don't really know without having the photos. Uh, you know, one of the things about Zeppelin is um, that's unfortunate for the history nerds like myself is um, there weren't a lot of photos likely because Jimmy and Peter Grant really didn't want that kind of thing. They, they yeah. probably wanted to keep thing, uh, keep a tight lid on the studio sessions. Yeah. You know, so there, there are photos here and there, like there's a handful of photos that I think Eddie Kramer actually took while he was recording houses of the Holy from Stargroves, which is Mick Jagger's home yeah. where they were set up recording that particular album. And they didn't record all of that album there, but they recorded some of it there. So there's a couple photos of Bonzo, and, and there's a famous one of him, and he's got this, he's got the mean bear look on his face. You know, he's <laughs> like, don't even think about taking another photo. Yeah. But you never know. He's got headphones on. He might be listening to a playback, and he's just in intense concentration. Yeah, they it just caught him at that moment. Saying, no. Yeah, you know how photos are. Absolutely. Yeah, but a lot of people, you know, like to say, you know, Bonzo, you know, the beast or whatever. And I just look at that stuff as kind of that's silly you know like yeah. when you're in the studio you're focused on your work yeah you know a moment captured like that doesn't it, it doesn't mean that you know he he was angry maybe he was maybe he was like god damn it eddie don't take pictures right now I'm trying yeah to concentrate. Or, <laughs> no but i do want <laughs> to say that i think you're doing a great job and have done a great job of not focusing on i mean john bottom was a person who was very young who was thrown into the spotlight who had everything you could ever want probably at your fingertips being in one of the biggest bands in the world. And, uh, he did live a pretty fast life, but, uh, I think you're very, 
respectful. Yeah, uh, that's th- all. This is a human yeah. being who has a family, and we're not obviously going down that road um, because there's plenty. Well, of look, stuff. you know, he's yeah. not the only one. There's so many musicians Absolutely. that struggled with whatever it was throughout their careers, and especially when you know thrust into that kind of fame. Um. Yeah, you know, none of us, uh, none of us should be making any kind of judgments without being put in that same situation. Which no one else can be in that situation. That no particular- one else really can be. What, yeah. what we do, you know, the little bit that we know, and that's again through books and interviews or what quote experts have said, is that he did not like being on the road. And as the years, the tours went on, they got bigger, they got more frenetic, more demanding. Yep. Playing bigger venues, less of that feeling of community with the audience, you know. Like, like I remember seeing an interview with John, and he was talking. He's talking about you know, like connecting with the audience, and people don't come to just you know look at you. He said something like that, like you know, with the Beatles, he felt like it was like a lot of it was like curiosity seeking, yeah. and you know, for them it was really important to connect with the audience. If they could establish that electric, what Plant calls the cosmic energy, you remember in yeah. Song Remains the Same, sure. this is cosmic energy. Everybody goes, yay, bash, you know, but that's the <laughs> thing that they're after. And that's, that's what all musicians are after. And, and, and the, the, the crazy thing is, as much as any great drummer, Bonzo had that way of communicating with people. He's one of those people, one of those drummers that transcends just playing the beat for the song. Yeah. You know, his his contribution to Zeppelin is so important and it can't be, you know, I guess I'm overstating it, but maybe it can't be overstated. It it, it creates that feeling in you that you that makes you love the music so much. You know, of course Jimmy does too, but the drums in general, this it's it's like a deep primal instinctive thing when you feel that hit you. And he he knew how to produce that. So you know, I think it was important to have that reciprocity between the audience and the band and they thrive off of, you know, the energy from the audience. But as, as the tours got bigger and they're playing these gigantic stadiums, you know, like the, the silver dome or whatever, or, you know, the Coliseum and, uh, you know, Seattle. And I mean, uh, it's, I, I think that it was just, you know, being away from, from his, his family and, maybe just naturally being a private kind of person. Yeah. You know, who just like to kind of hang out and chill at the pub and, and just hang with friends. And, you know, you've always got to be around all these like producers and yeah. uh, I mean like industry people and, you know, there's all kinds of unsavory hangers on and, and then the groupie scene and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. He doesn't strike me as a schmoozer as much. You know what I mean? As like, uh, <laughs> I, I highly doubt that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because, like, I like, think he strikes me as a very down to earth, direct person. No nonsense. Yeah, there's so many like avenues to t- to go down and talk about this. But one thing to say is is Bonham, I think forever will forever has been and will be. You know the the lists of drummers that like Rolling Stone or the rankings, whatever you want. He is always known as one of the greatest drummers of all time. That's just he. W- what's your thoughts on that? The, the ranking of drummers, and I mean, he's he's always on those. Which I don't is great, like I don't like rankings. Um, first I of agree. all, like a lot of times, you know, I see people say the greatest ever, this and that. that there's no such thing in any art. It's art. Yep. It's not sports. It's not like some quantifiable like he has the most home runs or he scored the most touchdowns. You know, and even within yep. that world that doesn't mean someone's the greatest ever no. because there's all kinds of, you know, gradations of greatness. And some people are, may have the most touchdowns ever, but they don't, you know, um, you know, there's some aspect of their game that's more lacking than someone else. Yeah. And I don't know if that makes sense. What I just said, No, but it does. But I think you get, yeah. I think you get my point. You know, the thing is like, with, especially when it comes to art, it's not quantifiable. That doesn't totally. make sense to say someone's the best. Van no. Gogh's the best painter? No, I don't think he's like the that. best. I think Gauguin was the best painter. That's silly. <laughs> you know, it's just silliness. Hemingway's the best writer ever. You know, no. Bonzo's the greatest drummer ever. No, I'm not going to say Bonzo's the greatest drummer ever. I'm not, not going to say Art Blakey's the great. There is no greatest drummer ever. Yeah. But he is definitely in the pantheon of the greatest drummers. Yeah. And I think 
that at some point, maybe not in the 70s, maybe not while he was alive, and this is one of the things I kind of wish had happened. It might have been something that gave him a boost of confidence or I don't know, man. I mean, I'm speculating here, but it seems, you know, at the at the very end um, of his life, he, you know, the day basically that he, he, the day before he died, he was in a rehearsal with the band preparing for their upcoming U.S. tour for the fall tour of 1980. And supposedly on the way to the rehearsal, he told Robert Plant that he should just hang it up. That he's just, and I'm paraphrasing, but he he was he was he was kind of lamenting to him that he didn't feel that he was as good as he used to be, and that he he's just oh. there's just so many other drummers that are better than me, and wow. you know, so it's self doubt, right? All yeah. artists go through self doubt. Yes. we all do, you know, and no matter what level, you know, I'm sure John Coltrane had moments of self doubt. You know, Every the greatest musicians. Artist. Yeah. Every artist is critical of their work and is hard on themselves at times. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't have a moment. You have that moment and it passes. It's like a storm cloud. Yeah. And I think if Bonzo, if if some of that acclaim or those accolades, like the the polls, the awards, the, the lists, you know, the Rolling Stones, greatest drummers of all time. Yep. If he was in the top five in 1979. You know, maybe that would have left him with a different feeling, huh. you know? Wow. That's and I often wish that, that he could have known or seen like, man, you know, one day you are going to be in the top three drummers on everybody's list Yeah, in the 90s. Because this really didn't start to happen until I think after the 80s. Hmm. You know, like in the 80s, of course, he was – he was uh, um considered i guess one of the greatest rock drummers of all time but yeah. to start transcending that into like greatest drummers of all time that seemed to happen going out of the 80s into the 90s 2000s you know all these different lists more more drum uh publications too you know started to come up yeah and then the and then with the advent of the internet then there's all these internet lists and blogs and we're doing what we're doing now. We're yeah. talking about John Bonham. Exactly. And there's more and more of this as the years go by. And, and again, not to name names, but there are other drummers who are considered really great drummers, but they don't, their, their popularity is not increasing over time. Like Bonham's is. Yeah. And I really think it's because he communicates something that's on a deeper spiritual level as a drummer, like all the great drum, like the truly great drummers do. And that's why I'm so attracted to him. I mean, as a jazz musician, I think a lot of people wonder, like, why are you so into, it's, it's almost like you're a jazz musician, but there's Led Zeppelin. It's like, no, I love, I love all kinds of music and I love all kinds of rock bands. I mean, I listen to, you know, Purple. I listen to Sabbath. I listen to other stuff from my youth, the yeah. classic ones. I even like Nirvana, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, but and then, you know, but there's something special about Zeppelin. There's something that has that mystique and that, that, that like extra something. Yeah. I really think it's Bonzo. I really think it's his touch, his musicality, his concept of sound and feeling in the way he played. And, yeah. um, and people are still chasing that lightning, man. It came and it went and everybody, I'm myself included, you know, I'm humbled at the fact that people, consider me a Bonham expert now and it's only through social media that this has kind of grown but you know the fact is I, I'm not a big fan of social media even though I participate in it a lot yeah you know I think it I think it does a lot of harm to society ironically yeah but there's a lot of good in it too and so you know we see an increasing number of people who want to talk about Bonham they want to know more about him they want to know more about his influences they want to know more about his gear so when you were talking about the Amber Vista light, I, I kind of, um, I, you know, I kind of missed that that answer. I, what I meant to say was the reason he went to the Amber Vista light was the venues are getting big and yeah. the, the wood shell Ludwig, you know, classic setup, even though they're beautiful sounding drums, he probably either heard or saw the Vista lights, and there's two things. He probably dug the fact that they're 
flashy and they attractive look cool. looking. Yeah. They look cool in the lights and they're loud as hell. Yeah, they cut. And they project, you know, you can he can hit them at the same with the same velocity or force as the green kit, but they're going to be louder. You know, and they're yeah. going to mic up louder. So when they play Madison Square Garden or they play Chicago Stadium, you know, it'll be that much easier to hear the articulation or the attack. Yeah. And I think Bonzo was, again, very conscious of sound. I think he was very conscious of, of what he wanted to project in terms of his sound. And he was also, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't think about this with him. He was sort of on the, I don't know if it's cutting edge, but he was he was at the, he was always kind of on the forefront of what was happening. For, I mean, you know, yeah. at least for a while there. Yeah, he was. He almost was what was happening, if that makes sense. Like he was creating. Yeah, I mean, this. Carmine, Carmine set him up with that kit and the big drums. And then you start seeing other drummers playing big, big, big ass bass drums sure. after 70. And then and then he goes to the to the Vista lights and other drummers were using Vista lights, too. But he was right in there. He was incorporating using timpani. Yes. Yeah, so and yeah, he was using a gong. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of things, and then and then when steel shells came out, he was like, "Hmm, I'm curious about these. I think I'm going to get them." Yeah. So then he gets steel shell, you know, kit. It's like I think had Bonzo lived past 1980, he might have been exploring, you know, new new stuff that was that was coming around then. Maybe even a, I, I kind of doubt it would have been electronic, <laughs> yeah. but who knows? You yeah. never know. He would he was using an electronic enhancement. On the drum solo. Yeah, exactly. You know, he and Moby Dick. Cool. He, not that it's not cool with other drummers, but he would have done it in his own way to make it like uh, just this this bottom thing. You know? Again, because he's a great musician. Yes. He would have utilized it in a musical way, not in some fatty, trendy way. Yeah. Yeah, you that's know? for sure. So, and, I mean, I bo being born in 90, obviously I was, you know, well after his heyday in like the 70s up till 80. To me, oh, was, you're born in '90. Born in '90, so wow, I got married in '90. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping off what you said before, I just to, to me as a 31 year old guy, it it embodies his life. Embodies what you know, maybe it's movies and TV shows, but what that era kind of looks like of this rock and roll star. I mean, he is just like the epitome <laughs> of a rock and roll superstar. And I do think, unfortunately, part of that is dying very young, which is terrible. But that's sort of what you think of with this this 1970s rock and roll, just live fast, die young kind of uh, thing that's thrown out there, which, again, is terrible because it would just be amazing. Same with like uh, any rock star yeah. who was taken too early. Um, it's it's sad, but it really it puts him in that that mythological, uh, you know, just he's he's one of the yeah i think that legends. factors into the into the mythologizing but you know one thing that i've i've found and that has frustrated me about um you know the bonham analysis i guess is that recently i feel like a lot of people didn't really focus on the influences or on yeah. the musicality aspect that sure. he had you know like for example jones said that they loved listening to Motown and Tamla records, hmm. you know, like the contemporary soul music of the time, yeah. like Marvin Gaye, uh, Stevie Wonder. And you can really hear that in the way his playing evolved quickly from like 69 to 71. And then from, so they, they had some major tours in those early days from 70, 71. They toured a couple times in 71. They came to the U.S., in the summer of 71 and they were promoting the fourth album and then they went to Japan and that was a big deal because not many rock bands, if any at all, especially at their level of stardom yeah. had toured Japan. Yeah. Sure. So they were really the first, they were before deep purple, um, which was, I think 72. They toured in, in, in September of 71, they played the Budokan Hall. They played in Osaka at the festival hall. They played big venues in, in Japan. And to me, that was kind of like a, a peak in some ways for yeah. them. 
Yeah. Even though they kept peaking, Zeppelin were kind of a band that would kind of dip down. You know, they wouldn't tour for a little while, like between 73 and 75. That's, that's kind of a long time to not tour. Yeah. But, you know, there are reasons for that. They formed their own record label. And then, um, you know, there, there, there were, there were different, you know, reasons for why they didn't tour through 74. Um, and then in 75, Robert Plant gets in this terrible auto accident in the summer and they were planning to come back again later in 75 so they ended up recording presence that year and then they didn't tour in 76 and then they come back in 77 but that was also i think related to a lot of you know the pressure to tour and bonzo really didn't like touring and so i i don't really you know claim to know what all the dynamics yeah. were between the bands socially i just know that they were like riding some a bit of a roller coaster yeah of course um but in those early days, it was almost like a straight climb. I yeah. mean, they were just ascending, ascending. 1970, 71, 72, when they recorded, when uh, How the West Was Won was recorded during their summer tour when they were promoting Houses of the Holy. You know, that whole era, Bonzo's playing, You can I can hear the evolution of his playing. Like he would have certain little figures or phrases or things that he liked to do that would change. And it was very rapid. You know, like you might hear him often playing a certain kind of thing on one tour. And then in the next tour, he's kind of added another bit of vocabulary mm. to the lexicon of his playing. Yeah, which we all do where we have our things that we do. Yeah. And then but it's that's natural, yeah. right? Especially when you're young, you're kind of absorbing influences. Yeah. But but what I was going to say about that is a lot of those things that he was absorbing into his playing, I think were coming from uh, funk music and soul music coming from bernard purdy yeah, drummers like zigaboo modalist from the meters um and and again no no hard proof that he was interviewed and said oh i love the new meters record yeah i've been playing along with it but for sure he was you know there's a scene in the song remains the same during moby dick you see like jason playing at home when he's a little boy yep and and more recently like when jason does his led zeppelin evening shows he has some footage uh, a lot of it's unseen home footage, which is really beautiful. It's really great. Um, but there's there's a clip, and it was posted. It was shared by Jason not long ago on Instagram. And it's the actual clip with the actual audio from when he's playing along. And, and John is sitting there playing like a djembe or a little hand drum. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, yeah, do, but yeah. it's a, a short scene in the movie, and Jason twirls his stick yep. while he's playing. Well, the song that he's playing along to is a Dr. John song. Oh, cool. You know, I can't remember the name of that song, but it's like, you know, at the right time, <laughs> yeah. at the right place, you know. Yeah. And that's the song he's playing along to. Now, I don't know who's on drums on that track, if it is Zigaboo or if it's Earl Palmer or who it is, but it's most certainly a New Orleans drummer, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, from that era, yeah. early 70s, New Orleans funk. That was on the little jukebox at home. and, and So cool. And again, it's not it's not anything like it's not an epiphany or like you know groundbreaking revelation to anyone who's really into Bonham but sometimes that connection is not made that you know Bonham he's a he's a world famous celebrity rock star j drummer but his heart is in funk and soul and R&B in addition to rock. I'm not saying he wasn't oh, into no. rock. But you're allowed to like other but things. and yeah, You're allowed to like other things, but I think the things that most informed his playing, and like Jones said, he wasn't really a rock drummer. Like He really enjoyed soul and funk drumming you know, kind of more. The guys who really impressed him were the guys playing on those records, like Stax, like Al Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. So you think about Stax and you listen to a recording of Otis Redding, let's say, or Carla Thomas or some of the people who recorded for Stax, you know, you can hear, I can hear a direct link to Bonham. Man. It's like, oh, no question, Al Jackson's pocket and the way his, the way he phrases, that's, you know, I can hear Bonham. Same thing with Roger Hawkins, who played on all those Atlantic Aretha Franklin yeah. sessions and Wilson Pickett. There's an album actually called Morning M O U R N I N G, like sadness. Morning in the Morning mm. by Otis Rush. And Otis Rush, you know, of course, a big influence because of "I Can't Quit You, Baby," right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So on this recording, if you listen to the way Roger Hawkins plays, 
I mean, it sounds so much like Bonham or vice versa. You know, it's it's like, to, to me, it's clear, like Bonham sounds like Roger Hawkins, you know, and that's at an era that was recorded in like 68, 69, Atlantic Records. You know, these guys had access to the Atlantic catalog, whatever they wanted. Yeah. At that time, they could just pick it right off the shelf, I'm sure. God, and you know, it's just like it's so, like this. These influences were then put into this, uh, uh, this monster drummer, this like just super talented the rock funnel. drummer. Yeah, and then and then boom, and then I it call gets, it the funnel. <laughs> yes, yeah, and you get this this guy who has has this super funky, soulful approach to playing rock and roll. Yeah, and blues. Yeah, heavy blues. Yeah, because Zeppelin were a heavy blues band in some respects early on. Definitely. Yeah, you know. But, yeah. but but so much more. I mean, you know, folk influences, Eastern influences. There's all that stuff that Page and Jones brought into it. And then you got Bonzo and Jones. I mean, yeah, Page and Jones. But then you got Bonzo and John Paul Jones bringing this Motown, Stax, uh, Atco, you know, Muscle Shoals, that rhythm section with Roger Hawkins. You know, they're bringing that into it. Yeah. And they're injecting it with this flavor, this like... And the Dr. John, you know, like New Orleans funk. I mean, all that stuff is in there. Yeah, absolutely. That's why Zeppelin makes you want to shake your ass so much more than so many other rock bands. And you, you were right before the right place, wrong time. The song <laughs> that is Zigaboo on drums, um, which uh, uh-huh. is just funny. See, so, there you go. Yeah, it's no, 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 man. No question in my mind that Bonham heard the meters, that he heard the wild. Al Chupitulas, and he heard Dr. John and all that great New Orleans funk. Yep. Those guys were hanging out down there. When they were on tour, they would stay in New Orleans often, you yep. know, just to hang out when they were playing Baton Rouge or playing Houston, playing Dallas, playing Mobile, Alabama, wherever. They 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 would hang in New Orleans because New Orleans was the fun the funnest place around yeah. in the South. Yeah, totally. You know, they love New Orleans. And you can even hear Robert Plant say it's our favorite city to hang out on one bootleg when they play in New Orleans in 73. That's awesome. And 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 they had a party at this place and, you know, a bunch of uh, New Orleans musicians were there. There's a great picture of John Bonham standing with Professor Longhair. Oh, cool. Man. I mean, they're 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 obviously they loved what they did and being around these people and just like absorbing all of it. And then. Like you said, the funnel, turn it around and then use it as an influence in your own music, which I think one key thing I'm getting from this is to listen to Zeppelin, which, you know, I love to li- I've always loved to listen to. But you can almost listen to him a little bit differently after hearing what you're saying about these influences. Exactly. Um, which right. which is really cool. My goal is to get, first of all, just not just, you know, people, but specifically drummers to listen to Bonham and listen to Zeppelin in a different way. Yeah. And listen for those listen for those things and and you know it's it's important to connect the dots I think in 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 a in American music. Yeah. I agree completely. You know? Um all right. Well, there's so much stuff to talk about. It's unbelievable. But uh for the sake of time here cuz I want to leave a little bit at the end for you know we can tell people where they can find you and all this good stuff. But so we got to say so John Bonham died on September 24th, 1980. Um, I think everyone kind of knows what happened, but it was an alcohol related death at a very young age. Um, he was 32 mm-hmm. years old, uh, just t- very, very sad, left behind, uh, obviously, his family. And Jason Bonham is carrying on the legacy now um, and doing some great things um, in yeah, honor of absolutely. his dad. And it's just a monster drummer in his own right. I mean, it's just an- incredible. And, totally. And has it has that sound. Yeah. Uh, down. I saw the show in uh, in Michigan at a, a Four Winds Casino in Michigan a few years ago, and man, it was it was very powerful, very emotional yeah. experience. You know, just um, yeah. especially seeing the the slideshow presentation and the way Jason p- presented the music. You know, it was it yeah. was really moving. I mean, it's the closest thing there there is really to um, <laughs> to john um so george uh you yourself are a jazz drummer like we said but you you have an affinity for for the the rock and roll side of things but you are really known as a, a jazz drummer so why don't you tell people i think you have some you're really you know have an awesome youtube channel and you're on social media you're really doing a great job of uh 
of marketing yourself, uh, which I think is super important these days. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> wow, that's that's a big compliment because I think I'm <laughs> terrible at self promotion and marketing. And I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I. I've had a pretty long career playing playing this music that everyone calls jazz, which I do not like, honestly, the term. Um, there's been a bit of a backlash lately against the term, you know, jazz, just because it's it's one of those titles that was sort of put on the music a long time ago. And for lack of, I think many people feel for lack of a better description, yeah. you know, it's jazz. They, it, sure, but, I get that. you know, what is jazz? I mean, jazz is so broad, broad of a... A, a label yeah. and I hate labels on music anyway, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, to, uh, of course, understandably, <laughs> you know, for terms of like people, yeah. Um, knowing how to find me, let's say, you know, yeah. I have a website. It's just simply my name.com and there's some background info on there. But again, I'm not, I'm not the greatest at self promotion. I always, I've always enjoyed the, the experience of playing with as many people you know, as I can, that I enjoy playing with the variety of being a freelance musician. Um, I've played with some, you know, very well-known jazz artists. I was playing with Ray Brown, the great bass players trio for about two years um, toward the end of his, his life. And that was an incredible, one of the most incredible experiences I've had, you know, working with a, working with an artist of that caliber um, in their band but I played with a lot of, you know, great jazz pianists like people like Hank Jones, Elvin Jones' brother, yeah, uh, Tommy Flanagan, the great pianist from originally from Detroit, Barry Harris, uh, Cedar Walton. I used to work with Cedar Walton quite a bit. Monty Alexander is another great pianist that I had the honor to perform with and record with uh, for several years. Joey D. Francesco. Um, anyway, all that stuff sure. you can find on my website, you know, there's a bio there and stuff, but as far as playing rock and roll music, I really have not done much at all aside from, I mean, in recent years, aside from a, uh, YouTube, uh, a, a sort of a virtual project that I have with a few guys who are spread out across the globe and it's called people's front of Zeppelin, which you may know about. It's awesome. Yeah, it's it's been fun. It's especially during the pandemic, but we got started actually before virtual, you know, re recording and playing was a craze. Yeah. Um, but it's it's mainly out of our love for Zeppelin and just, you know, the fun that we have covering their their music. Um, but it's it's, you know, grown a little bit, which is really nice to see and and we may even have an opportunity to do some performing uh this this year in in Europe. Uh the awesome. guitarist our guitarist Ivan, he's from Dubrovnik, Croatia, and uh, he may be arranging some things for us there. The bass player Pete is uh, located in New York, and the vocalist is uh, Ty Ver. He's he lives in Los Angeles. He does a lot of studio session work. Great musician, multifaceted musician, and great singer. That's um, awesome. And you know my story. I'm I'm here in sh cold Chicago. It's down in the single digits tonight. Oh wow, jeez, I'm nowhere near there. <laughs> Where are you located? I'm in You're in Cincinnati. I'm in Cincinnati, right? and it's it's like it's actually been kind of nice today. It's like 30s. I mean, the 40s. It's not too yeah. bad. Oh, that's balmy for Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Chicago is a different <laughs> level of uh, of cold. But we is, we yeah. get there. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll get down to the you know five ten degree weather here in the next month or so. But um. Yeah. Well, George, um, I, this has been amazing. So for everyone looking, George F L U D A S is his last name, obviously. So I'll put a link for everything and I'll have George send me any extra links that I'll put in the description and everyone can find it. And, um, Bonham is a very big topic and he's a big drummer and he, he lived a big life. So I hope we covered everything that people are interested in. And, uh, if there's anything else yeah. you want, then you can go to, um, George's YouTube channel. There's Bonhamology, which I'll link in the description. And um, and then obviously our buddy Terry Keating, who's Bonzolium, has some other great stuff as well. And um Terry and I may and if I might add, Terry is the whole reason I got into doing the uh YouTube channel. There you go. I, I would not yeah. have done any of this if it hadn't been for him kind of goading me on. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. His, and he was right. I mean, he was right. You know, Bonham lo looms large for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, his and, style uh, and way of doing stuff is just, it's like, it's very entertaining and it's just like, he's, he's got oh, a Terry? way about him. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, he's just naturally a uh, very funny and engaging person. Yeah. You know? So yeah, great, well, great George, guy. I want to thank you for taking this much time to uh, share your passion with me, and uh, you know, hopefully, I'll be at the Chicago show next year um, in twenty twenty two. I guess that's this year because it's we're five days yeah. into uh, January. So um, <laughs> right, yeah, it's going well, fast. Thank you so much for being here and thanks for everyone for listening. And I hope everyone is having a great new year and um, enjoyed this episode. So George, thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Uh, The feelings mutual. And um, I really appreciate you asking me to do the podcast. It's been fun. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.